Hey everyone, it's Daniel here. Before we get into today's episode, just want to give you a quick reminder that I will be hosting a giveaway for the podcast soon. The podcast is turning it's turning one in June. Uh, it's turning one in June on June the 13th, and I'm excited to do a giveaway uh, for to celebrate the one year anniversary of the show. Um, I did a uh, I did a short episode about the giveaway, detailing everything, and there will also be some details in the description of today's episode about the giveaway. Uh, but just to quickly give you some details about how you can enter and what it's for, um, I am partnering with the Isaiah 117 House for this giveaway. If you are not aware, uh, the Isaiah 117 House is a Tennessee-based nonprofit organization that provides physical and emotional support in a safe and loving home for children awaiting foster care placement. Um, they have locations all across the Southeast United States, and they're a really, really great organization. And so I'm excited to have this opportunity to partner with them. If you want to uh, enter the giveaway, all you have to do is um, make a donation to the Isaiah 117 house through Venmo. Uh, you can make your, your donation in $5 increments. So if you make a $5 donation, that will be one submission into the giveaway. A $10 donation will be two submissions and so on and so forth. Uh, the winner of the giveaway will be announced on Monday, June the 12th, and they will receive the first ever Radio Face t-shirt, the first ever Radio Face sticker, and a $50 Visa gift card, all for all given to you, uh, shipped straight to you. Uh, so again, you can make as many entries as you like. All proceeds will go directly to the Isaiah 117 house. Uh, none of this will be coming back to me, so I really hope you take this opportunity to support this great organization, all the great work they're doing. If you don't have uh, to make a donation, you'll need to do it through Venmo. So if you don't have a Venmo account, you can download it for free on your phone, hook up your bank account, and then make a donation to uh, the Chambliss Center, which handles all the finances for the Isaiah 117 house. Uh, the handle for the Chambliss Center on Venmo is at C-H-A-M-B-L-I-S-S-C-E-N-T-E-R. Um, that's where you can find them on Venmo. And whenever you make this donation to enter this, the giveaway, just make a note with your donation, uh, you know, just distinguishing that this is for the giveaway. So you can make a note saying Radio Face Podcast. You can make a note that just says podcast. You can make a note that says giveaway. Anything along those lines that denotes that you are making this donation to the Isaiah 117 house for this giveaway. Uh, as I said, the winner will be announced on Monday, June the 12th. So you've got a lot of time to enter this giveaway. Uh, and I'm really excited to partner with the Isaiah 117 house and raise some money for a great cause. Thank you all for all the support you've given me uh, over this year so far. And I'm excited for year number two. Thank you for the Isaiah 117 house for partnering with me. And I'm really excited to uh, take this opportunity to help out a great organization. There'll be some more details about this down in the description. So if you'd like to learn more, head down there to the description, check everything out down there for more details. And if you have any questions about the giveaway, feel free to reach out to me on social media at Radio Face Pod on all social media platforms, or simply go to... Um, or simply email me at radiofacepod at gmail.com with any questions you have about the show or about the giveaway. Thank you again for all your support. And now let's jump into the episode. Hey there, everyone. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of the podcast. My name is Daniel Trinum, and I will be your host as always. Before we get started with today's episode, I want to let you know of a few things of note. First, you may or may not be aware that I host another podcast called The Third Seat. The Third Seat is unrelated to the podcast you are listening to right now, but if you'd like to check it out, then I will put a link in the description of today's episode that you can use to listen to it. If you like this podcast, then I really think you will like The Third Seat as well, so I highly recommend you check it out. Next, I want to let you know of a few ways you can support the podcast. First, be sure to tell a friend if you enjoy the show. Word of mouth is not only a great way to help support the show, but it's also zero cost. Secondly, if you enjoyed today's episode, then be sure to leave a five-star review wherever you get your podcasts. Leaving a positive review is one of the best ways of not only supporting the show, but it also gives me direct feedback from you regarding how you feel about the show overall. I greatly appreciate if you decide to take the time to support the show in any of these ways. Finally, if you'd like to follow me or the show on social media, then feel free to check out the description of today's episode. Here you will find all affiliated and mentioned links, as well as how you can support the show online. As always, I want to thank you for tuning into and supporting the show. It really means a lot to me, and I hope you enjoy today's episode as much as I enjoyed making it for you. But first, I'd like to take a moment to thank the sponsor of today's episode, Lucky to Know You Apparel. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever loved your friend so much that you just want to squeeze them until they explode? 
Well, this local Chattanooga-based clothing brand wants to portray that feeling into a community that appreciates the people in their lives. Today's sponsor, Lucky to Know You Apparel, is using fashion and feelings to bring people together, making them ecstatically say, can you believe we happen to exist at the same time? Check out their Instagram, at Lucky to Know You Apparel, and website, www.luckytoknowyou.com, to purchase your own apparel or gift one to a friend. Listeners of this podcast can use code FEELINGLUCKY for 15% off your next order. Again, that is code FEELINGLUCKY, spelled F-E-E-L-I-N-L-U-C-K-Y at checkout for 15% off your next order. And hey, if no one has told you today, we are lucky to know you. All right, everyone, welcome back to another episode of the podcast. My name is Daniel Trinum. I will be your host for this episode as always. And I'm excited to bring you this episode of the podcast. One of my uh, favorite things to do on this show and one of the, the pleasures I have of, of hosting the show and, and running it is obviously having really fun conversations with unique individuals and just having great conversation. But part of this, uh, the privilege of this is being able to be in the same room with people that are much smarter than me, that know a lot of things that I don't know about, uh, are experts in fields that I am not an expert in, uh, and I get the chance to talk to them, to get, to, to pick their brain a little bit and, and learn about them. And so today is one of those opportunities. Uh, my, my guest today is Miss uh, Tanya Menoni, and I am really excited to speak with you today. So Tanya, thank you very much for joining me. Well, you flatter me. Thank <laughs> you. Absolutely. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So uh, before we kind of jump into just the main conversation, would you care to just share a little bit about you, your story, and, and kind of what you do and how you got to where you are today? Oh my goodness. Okay. So <laughs> if, you, I, if you can. In a nutshell, I'm a pharmacist, but really when people hear that, I think one thing comes to mind, probably what you've seen on the news, like that person maybe counting the pills with that blue so, tray. So funny enough, I, I worked at a pharmacy for like three years, not as a pharmacist, obviously, but I worked at a pharmacist. So I have a very good idea okay, of what you're, yes, what you're talking about. Exactly. Yeah. So with me, it all started with chemistry. I just looked around and I was like, I'm good at this. And it kind of <laughs> seems like nobody else is. I'm going to go with this. So I got my chemistry degree and I really didn't know what I wanted to do with it. And I started doing research in pharmaceutical chemistry at the mm -hmm. University of Utah. And then I realized I didn't like being in a lab, a very quiet lab yeah. with no people and with me and my <laughs> mouse breast cancer cells. And I was like, how do I use this chemistry for something else? And I decided to go to pharmacy school. Yeah. So in pharmacy school, I, I learned about pharmaceutical compounding, which for me was a way of being able to join, like really join chemistry with pharmacy. And I've done both retail pharmacy, which is traditional, what everyone yeah, thinks yeah. about, which I really love because that gets you interaction with the public mm -hmm. and it keeps you very in the know with public health. Mm -hmm. um, but right now I work for Designer Drugs Pharmacy where we get to really do a lot of creative things. Yeah. And I like to say I'm a creative chemist because sometimes people <laughs> think about chemistry as boring, but it's actually, you get to be really creative with well, what I do. Well, when I think of a chemist, in my mind, the first image that comes to my head is like you know a guy in like a white lab coat his hair is like really stringy and he's just like pouring things yeah. into when there's like explosions happening and just numbers written on a chalkboard somewhere and it's just it makes sense to that person but to nobody else it makes any sense right. I'm, I, obviously that doesn't seem to be the case for your line of work yes uh, i'm like that might have been my physics professor <laughs> more so but yes i'm just kidding absolutely um not in our line of work and really what pharmacists do is try to make these complicated and complex yeah. microscopic yeah. molecular things and we try to put it into lay person's language yeah yeah, you know, it's funny you say that. So like I said, I, I worked at a pharmacy and for much of it, I was, I would either do deliveries or I would like kind of quasi do the job of a tech, like counting some stuff and, and filling some prescriptions. And, you know, when you work in it long enough, like you start to know what some of the medications are for. And, but every now and then, like the, the head pharmacist, his name is Jeff. He would say, you know, someone would be like, Hey, what, what, what's with this medication or what's this thing? And he'd be like, Oh, well this part is used for this thing. And this thing would do. And I was just like, yeah, there's, there's definitely levels to this. Like, I don't know what he's, I don't know what he's going on about. Like, I can tell you what these few med medicines are for, but 
he he's on a different plane with everything else he's talking about. So uh, that's funny. So so where you work? Did you is this like your company? Like you started, or is this a company that you you work for? No, I work for Designer Drugs yeah. Pharmacy. So Randy Davis started it twenty <clears throat> years ago, gotcha. and he's been compounding for twenty years. Yeah. And he founded the business really on bioidentical hormone replacement therapy. Oh wow! Which is there's a two dollar word. I word know. Word. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> which I'd love to get into today. I think we have enough time to, because that's really my passion. Yeah. And I went to University of Utah and a lot of things, they really move from West to East. Yeah. And so 20 years ago, that's what I did while I was in school. I got a chance to work at a pharmacy much like designer yeah. drugs and learned a ton about helping mostly women yeah. back then with bioidentical hormones. Yeah. And so when I decided to go back to compounding, I knew that I wanted to work for Randy yeah. basically. Yeah, well, well, awesome. Well, I, I want to hear about it. So, so what? Did, if you, if you don't care, what did you say he he kind of pioneered or, or worked in whenever he started? So bio bioidentical, bioidentical hormone replacement therapy. hormone replacement therapy. So what does what what's all that mean so in, in 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 normal people terms? Normal people terms. <laughs> have you heard of replacing testosterone? Yes. Okay. Yes. So that's a bioidentical hormone. Okay. So a, a male replacing testosterone. Let's say he gets to be in his forties, fifties starts to decline, mm -hmm. that would be called bioidentical hormone replacement. A non-bioidentical hormone they usually use in women. Mm -hmm. So this actually starts being a women's health topic yeah. for me. And so yeah. this is where I get a little passionate because we want to, like, you immediately knew what I was talking about with replacing testosterone yeah. for men. Yeah. So with women, though, this want, this becomes this really an inflammatory topic almost that everyone wants to get involved. Um, we want to leave it up to the FDA what women are allowed to use. But oftentimes the FDA has approved non-bioidentical hormones, which means they don't look just like the structure of the hormones our body makes. Mm -hmm. So they're sort of kind of fitting into receptor sites, and yeah. they're also doing a little bit of other weird things yeah. to our bodies. Yeah. And in my opinion, if we can replace with a bioidentical hormone, why are we doing these other non-bioidentical hormones? Yeah. So a lot of times the only way you can get bioidentical hormone replacement is through a compounding pharmacy. Okay. So so this may be a, may be a silly question, but just to make sure I'm, I'm understanding here. So bioidentical, that to me sounds like, you know, like there's obviously naturally occurring hormones and yes. lots of things happening in our bodies. Is a bioidentical hormone a obviously a replacement, but it's a like a one to one one to one replacement you know like an like apples for apples okay so so is there is there a version this is a, kind of a two part question is there a non bioidentical version of testosterone replacement uh, therapy therapy that that is currently used or is it is it largely just bioidentical not for men okay no. so that so then my yeah so then my second question is if if that's the case and there's probably a lot to this from what you just told me is why is that the case on the other side of the spectrum? You know, what, like, why is there, why is there not, or why is it not widely used, uh, bioidentical? You know, therapy? that's that a, a great question. And it used to be thought that the FDA or drug makers couldn't patent bioidentical yeah. hormones, but they clearly can, but really what they can patent are like the drug matrices. Like mm -hmm. they can patent the testosterone in the gel yeah. and then call that matrix yeah. androgel. Yeah. So I think that's the problem is yeah. they can patent the drug product itself, but they mm -hmm. can't patent a hormone because it's yeah. a biologic yeah. that your body made it. Yeah. So, the, but they can patent if they change the hormone slightly yeah. and put a methyl group on the side chemically, mm -hmm. then they can patent that yeah. and they can make a bunch of money off of it. Yeah. So, so in regards to this topic, where do, where, where does what you do specifically fit into, into this yes. wide ranging topic? So, Right now I'm pursuing, pursuing my fellowship in anti-aging and metabolic medicine. Yeah. And basically I'll see women and men, but I'll get labs from local physicians and non-local physicians because designer drugs is licensed in 50 states. Mm -hmm. So I have doctors in Mississippi and <laughs> they, because they do not teach you this in pharmacy or medical school. Or, or high school or middle or school. <laughs> Yeah, that was a good one. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that is so true. Just, just to let the record stand, they did not uh, teach, they did not teach no. me this in kindergarten <laughs> or in middle school. Continue. Yes, <laughs> exactly. So n people don't know this, and it just makes perfect sense. Yeah. And when you start hearing it, you're like, it's... It's one of those, like my school, University of Utah, just got to say go Utes. It's a top 20 pharmacy school. So this is not like I didn't go to some 
school where they're teaching just the back door kind of back alley stuff. Yeah, you yeah. know what I'm saying? Yeah, like, yeah. And I just trust what I know yeah. and it's physiologic sense. Yeah. And so a lot of doctors trust what they know and they're yeah. like, this makes sense. I want this for my patient, yeah. but I don't have the time to get myself the additional education. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to send the labs to Tanya yeah. and let her dose it, yeah. send it back to me with the justification report mm -hmm. and my patients are going to have this. Yeah. So that's what I do now yeah. is just make these recommendations and then we compound it. Mm -hmm. So every, and that's the other nice thing, like manufactured drugs come in for, you know, typically four to six different strengths. Yeah. And that's not like every patient you see is not one of six versions. Yeah. So I'll see a lady that needs a little bit of this, a little bit of this. And then in six weeks, we'll retest and we can just tweak a little bit yeah. of this. And our lab just makes it Yeah. just for her wow. or him. So it's like custom made products almost. Yes. Yeah. And then just in, you know, to, to make Amanda proud, yeah. designed for you. We're designer <laughs> drugs. It's designed is, for you. That's for you, Amanda. Yes. <laughs> our marketing team. Uh, well, cool. Cool. So. You, you mentioned something just kind of in passing that I, I had written down. I wanted to definitely ask you about because from my perspective, it seems like this particular topic has been, it's, it's become a little bit of a buzzword. Like it's become a little bit of, a, of, you know, a very normalized topic, I guess. But you, you mentioned uh, just in passing, you said anti-aging. And I think it's a very interesting topic because like I said, for one, this is something that admittedly I know very little about. So I'm coming at, I'm coming at You're this. Pretty from, young. Yeah. I'm, I'm coming at this from the standpoint of someone who has a, on paper, what I think I understand what it is, but it's still a very like limited understanding of it. But um, the, the reason I say all this is in the just health industry in general, there's a lot of great advice. There's a lot of great science. Like, you know, mm -hmm. there's, there's a lot of, if you're seeking to solve an issue or heal an ailment, there's a lot of different ways you can solve these problems in general. Mm -hmm. But there's also a lot of like, uh, you know, quote unquote silver bullets that you can, you know, take this one thing and you'll, you'll, you may be 60, but you'll feel 20 or, you know, you'll, you'll, all these things will happen. And it, a lot, it's, it can be difficult at times to kind of sift through what is real good advice and what is real good uh, health and things that you can do to, uh, things that you can do to improve your, improve your health or, you know, uh, kind of, kind of, uh, get a few years back if that makes sense. And there's also a lot of, uh, snake oil salesmen out there for, for lack of better terms. So it, from, from your standpoint, how do you kind of make sense of, of all this, where we currently stand in the, in the health and longevity and anti-aging world that we live in? So it, it still does come down to the research yeah. and, um, a lot of times I don't like feeling like I am, um, what's the word that I'm looking for, um, in bondage to research yeah. and clinical data, but it, it matters and it has to matter to anyone that has a, a license yeah. and is a clinician. So I found it interesting what they called the fellowship, the anti-aging and metabolic fellowship. However, it is all based in clinical data. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's basically functional medicine. And so it is physicians it's mostly mds and do's and then you've got some allied fields like myself yeah so being a pharm d but you're basically looking at patients it's the moment before the 10 years before you're actually sick mm -hmm. the 10 years before your ranges mm -hmm. your lab values are out of range mm -hmm. because i've noticed from seeing patients we have these lab ranges these values that the ranges are so big that you are sick before the value flags high or yeah. low. Yeah. And it's interesting, but you we do nothing about it usually. Yeah. Unless you're in functional medicine or metabolic medicine, you're not going to do anything about it unless it's flagging high or low. And I think that um, glucose and insulin are a great example. Thyroid stimulating hormones mm -hmm. are a great example. P patients are feeling unwell even with lab values in normal ranges. Yeah. And that's an indicator of things going wrong. And precision and anti-aging medicine is looking deeper and past that into other lab values. And maybe we're looking at neurotransmitters. Yeah. Maybe we're looking at urine metabolites. Yeah. So we're going so far beyond like Googling on yeah. the snake oil. Yeah. We're like looking very, very deep yeah. and very targeted. Yeah. But so you have to find 
a physician yeah. that knows what they're doing. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so, so correct me if I'm if I'm under you know if I'm if I'm misunderstanding, but you know uh, what you're saying is a lot of times there'll be some kind of health uh, event happen. You know, whatever it is, heart attack or, or stroke or, or you know fill in the blank here with whatever health event, um, and we view that as like a singular event. Like, oh, this this thing happened to this person at this time. But a lot of times, like what you said, it, it's it's a kind of like a snowball going down a hill. Like it starts small and it may not even necessarily be something that is uh, something you notice up front. Like you said, you know, someone's initial results or initial uh, kind of lab readings will all be relatively normal and within a, within a healthy range. But if you're able to dig deeper beyond the surface, you can see that there are these like red flags that will eventually compound into some other kind of uh, either, uh, you know, kind of quickly aging process or some kind of uh, negative health experience in the future. Is that, is that kind of what you're saying? Yes. Like yeah. My cardiology module, it was taught by Dr. Mark Houston. He's a Vanderbilt cardiologist. It was so riveting, but he put it as, you know, you have these patients as a cardiologist. I'm not a car cardiologist, but he <laughs> hey, is. me neither. And I listened to him. So, and this is what he said. He said, you have these patients come in and you're going to tell them everything looks great. Yeah. And then you're going to see them in three years. They're going to have had a very severe myocardial infarction. They're going to be like, Doc, where were you? Yeah. And that's what his point is. Like there were indicators. If you had looked yeah. at that visit that you told that patient that everything looks great, you're fantastic that we could have gotten on top of mm -hmm. that would have prevented that myocardial infarction. Yeah. And it's very interesting. He's actually broken it down to top 25 modifiable risk factors. It's very, very interesting because some of these are changes people could make in their lives, like literally right now. And yeah, um, yeah it's fascinating. So, so, so what, what are some of those? Because that was going to be my next question. Well, it's like, you know, you don't have to go, you don't have to give yeah. every single thing, but, oh, what, I won't, but. but, but what are some, you know, for, for me, like, again, there, there is no shortage of like health advice, good and bad yes. on, you know, online and in person everywhere. Uh, but I think a lot of times I think people can view really trying to get to the bottom of what is good and solid health advice, kind of like something that's, you know, it's, it's, it's almost in a weird way. There's so much to dig through and so much to find out and learn that it's just like, you know, it's like, why even try? Like, let's just, let's just hope for the best. And, you know, we'll just cross that bridge when we get there. So in, I in your view, that feeling, yeah, yes. Yeah. And that's why I love his book because his book is full of references because he's essentially done exactly like the, why even try? He yeah. actually did that. He yeah. read everything, com compiled every last piece of data. And fish oil is actually one of the top, yeah. omega-3 fatty yes. acids yeah. is one of the top 25 modifiable risk factors. Yeah. You, If you will take fish oil, a thousand milligrams at least every day, you will have lower rate of myocardial infarction and stroke because it's anti-inflammatory yeah. and anti-lipid. Well, It'll lower well, cholesterol. That's good, that's good to hear for me personally because I do take fish oil. Good. <laughs> I know. I think that, that is one everyone should take. I give yeah. it to my kids. I recommend it to the elderly, yeah. to everyone. Yeah. So so uh, that's I, I wanted a, kind of a two-parter question here. Uh, one, I, I know fish oil, like it's talked about a lot. It's like, you know, mm -hmm. omega threes and omega this and all these different things. But like, what is it about that specifically? Because like, I have heard a lot of good things about it. And I, from what I understand, I, I believe it is, you know, a good thing to, uh, to take and, and a good thing to use. And as you're saying, it's also a good thing, but what, what about it? It makes it so good for you, if that makes sense. So to put it into my pharmacist, into layperson terms, <laughs> so it's the DHA and EPA in yeah. it. And you always want to look at those two, because those are the actual omega-3 fatty yeah. acids. And it's all just about the, the density of the oil. Mm -hmm. But honestly, I think of it as it makes your oils, just everything in your body, um, less, less goopy, less viscous. Everything's flowing better. And I know that is, sounds is, is funny. That a, is that a technical pharmacy it's term? Exactly. Goopy? No, it's a Tanya pharmacy <laughs> term. That is what makes people come back to me because I may, they remember it, <laughs> but it makes your skin better for that yeah. reason too. Yeah. You think you just, your skin oils are going to be better. It's great for dry eye for that same reason. Yeah. Like your eye glands have oils and the yeah. oil needs to flow. Gotcha. So it's just making, instead of the plaque building up in your arteries, everything's just flowing. Yeah. So. Gotcha. 
And then second part to that. So you mentioned that being like one of the, one of the, you know, first things you would recommend. What are some of the other kind of simple things that people could do? I mean, obviously there's, I'm sure there's some things that are more involved than just going to the store buying a thing of fish oil and just using it every day until you run out. But, um, what, what are some other simple ways that people can, you know, actively start today or, you know, in it soon to start, uh, you know, improving their health. This one was really really wild to me. So it's all about nitric oxide because nitric oxide is your number one vasodilator. Mm -hmm. So vasodilation is what's important because, uh, you know, an infarction is where the blood's not flowing to the heart muscle. So the muscle dies. Mm -hmm. Same thing like with the stroke, yeah, you're not yeah. getting blood flow to yeah. the brain unless it's hemorrhagic, but yeah. that's something different. So it stop taking proton pump inhibitors and stop using mouthwash. Really? And both of those are because of nitric oxide, because 30% okay. of your nitric oxide is converted in your mouth yeah. and the other 30% is in your gut and it requires the correct pH. So, so what was, what was the first thing you said? So mouth, well, I don't yeah. know which order I said, but mouthwash was yeah, one of mouthwash. them. So chronic mouthwash users, uh -huh. you are changing the flora in your mouth to such a degree that you are going to decrease the amount of nitric oxide in your blood by 30%. Interesting. And then proton pump inhibitors, which is like um, Pepsid, or not Pepsid, excuse me, um, Protonics, mm. Prilosec, yeah. Omeprazole, gotcha. all of those, yeah. which people, some people live on. Yeah. Like those are acid reducers. Yeah. And so they are raising the pH in your gut and they're changing the flora and everything about yeah. your gut needs acid to make nitric oxide. Yeah. 30% of it. Interesting. So those were two of the top 25. And he literally was like, which it's easier said than done. Yeah. And that's yeah. where you have a cardiologist tell it, get all the patients off of proton pump inhibitors. And I'm like, have you ever <laughs> tried to talk to a patient and get them off a proton pump inhibitor? Yeah. Like they will, will fight you. <laughs> they do not want heartburn. That's funny. But you have to do it slowly. If yeah. anyone is listening to this and, and now you're scared, um, just in all honesty, lower the dose yeah. and then you go every other day yeah. you do it very slowly or you yeah. will have some serious acid rebound but talk to your pharmacist and your doctor i see i, I didn't know these things see like <laughs> honestly it's it's funny you mentioned this like I, I don't use mouthwash but it's not because like not because of the reason you just stated because one i didn't know about that <laughs> yeah, but, who does? or not that i'm like against it but it was more it's always just been more of like i don't know if i want to spend <laughs> five or six dollars on a bottle of mouth like i'll just i'll just you know whatever and i just never really got around to it so like that's interesting to hear that because like i said I, I know very little about all these things so to me it's just like oh it's mouthwash it makes yeah. you you know feel and smell all minty and there you go you're good to go but i you know it's it's interesting and you brought up something kind of that i've, I've for the last few years, I've been like mildly interested in is the the impact that our uh, our gut has kind of on just on overall health, not just from a standpoint of like, you know, your stomach might hurt, but you kind of briefly mentioned it there, like uh, the the kind of uh, what's the, what's the words I'm looking for here? Kind of the, the bacterial environment in your, in your gut. If, if, yeah, exactly. Like the impact from what microbiome. I've learned, micro, that's the word I was like, <laughs> what's the word I'm looking for here? The micro, the, the microbiome kind of in your gut, the impact it has on your overall health is something that I only learned about really in the last few years, just from like reading different books and just, you know, browsing online. And, um, I never realized from, from what I've read and what I've seen, like the huge impact it has on your overall health, not just from a, not just in a isolated sense of like your, you know, uh, kind of the digestive part of your health, but it really plays a huge role in, mm -hmm. in your, in, in a lot of different health issues from what I understand. Uh, you, you care to talk about that just a little oh, bit? Oh, absolutely. That's actually, I, I did some seminars last year for menopausal women, perimenopausal women. And that's actually when I do a menopause action plan, yeah. fix the gut is number one, because you have not only a microbiome, but you have estrogen receptors yeah. in your gut and you have to fix the gut first because most People nowadays, especially with all the allergens, mm -hmm. have some degree of leaky gut, mm -hmm. and there's several ways that we can fix it. Mm -hmm. But that um, that those gut cells, the lining is just one single layer thick. So as soon as you get inflammation going on, and most people are inflamed, um, you are going to get some additional spacing, and you're going to be starting to allow these macromolecules through. And then that's leading to other types of inflammation. Yeah. So healing the gut is super important. 
And there's another book we carry at my pharmacy called Let's Talk Shit. <laughs> Excuse the language. <laughs> but written by Dr. Sabine Hazan, I think is her name. She is so funny and brilliant. But she, this was absolutely riveting when I learned this. She does fecal transplants. So she's a gastroenterologist. And she did these trials where she would take a severely, um, very severely uh, autistic child who um, did, wasn't even speaking, wasn't even saying mom or dad. And she looked at a stool sample from this child and then looked at a stool sample from his siblings. Mm -hmm. And his microbiome was not very differentiated where yeah. he had only four different it was just very clear that everyone else in his family had all the different flora they should have mm -hmm. and this child did not yeah. when she did a, the fecal transplant from a sibling to so she basically she'll rinse the bowel out yeah. i don't know exactly what the surgery yeah. looks yeah. like I don't i'm either. not a gastroenterologist <laughs> <laughs> neither are you yeah, right I, I don't know either so we're, we're, for for once in this conversation we're on the we're on the same understanding <laughs> And so she replaced, they, they called a fecal transplant, yeah. and she replaced his feces essentially with a siblings yeah. and it's to replace the flora. And yeah. then that child started speaking. Same thing with an Alzheimer's patient, could not remember his daughter's date of birth, was so far gone with dementia and Alzheimer's. Same thing when she looked at his stool, it was not differentiated. It had barely any differentiation of the flora. And when she did the transplant, he was able to start remembering. So there's just, wow. there's a very significant gut brain connection. And they yeah. think it's via the vagal nerve. Wow. That, it's for whatever reason. I mean, maybe it's just because like, you know, you, you alluded to this, like, this is something that I'm only just now kind of in the last few years or so really hearing about and learning about, but like, it's because I've heard about uh, some different cases like that. Like I, I read some book, what was it called? Uh, I think it was called Brain Maker, I want to say. I forget who wrote it, uh, but it was all about the the impact that the gut microbiome has on your your health overall and the things that can kind of hurt it and things you can do that can help it. And it was I, I thought it was very interesting. Uh, but they had mentioned something similar to what you had talked about with the, with the autistic child. And I just... It, they, they weren't making the case that like this is a surefire way to like reverse something like that because obviously there's more factors that go into it but they were very clearly making the distinction that this definitely does play a factor in in you know this person's health and can very well play a factor in your own health yes uh and he was you know i, I forget the author's name i'll have to look it up but um he was kind of making the point of a lot of the health issues we you know in a in a kind of first world country like a lot of the things we deal with he wasn't necessarily saying that they are because of our, you know, lack of diversified micro, my, mm -hmm. <laughs> microbiome, uh, but that definitely plays a very large role. And we don't really think about that a lot. We don't really think about how that's been impacted over the years due to, you know, our environments or due to the food that we eat or things like that. And I just thought it was really interesting because it seems like for whatever reason, it is how I understand it, the microbiome seems to be such a, a heavy hitter in our overall health, yet it's something that you don't really hear about a lot. You know, uh, you know, not that I'm necessarily expecting people to be walking around on the street being like, hey, did you know that you're gut micro <laughs> microbiome? Like, you know, but you don't hear about it. Like you hear about exercising and, and getting good sleep and talking to your doctor and taking your medicine when you need to, but mm -hmm. you're kind of missing that other piece that you don't really hear about a lot. So right. I, I just think it's really interesting how that seems to play such a huge role in our health overall, you know? I actually think you just said something really important that I do. Oh, well, it did, you. well, it did, <laughs> it did improve those, those, yeah. um, patients. It, it was not a cure all, yeah. but yeah. as like you're saying, it was a portion of yeah. that piece. And I think we hear about it now, um, only really with regards to probiotics, yes. I think. And then some of the health food community is yeah. getting really into, um, you know, doing the fermented foods yeah. and the kimchi and yeah. instead of probiotics. Yeah. But we do a lot of, um, my favorite thing to use to heal the gut in the functional medicine community is called low-dose naltrexone. I just want to plug that real quick for anyone that's yeah. listening, um, because it is just a really neat medication, a really neat therapy that will heal the 
heal an inflamed gut that is allowing those larger macro molecules through in about six months. Yeah. So, so it, you have to use that and replace as yeah, well some yeah. probiotics. Yeah. So so on this topic, uh, and and I'm I'm glad you brought it up because uh, in that in that book I read, he was like a huge huge kimchi fan, and I've I've yet to come around on kimchi because like I've, I've tried to like it. It's just it's one of the things that I, I don't know. I haven't I haven't loved it yet. Uh, but they talk a lot about like fermented foods and things like uh, like Greek yogurt and and uh, kefir or kefir. How, I'm not sure exactly how you say it, but it's like a fermented uh, like dairy drink, I believe. Um, does that like is, is there some legitimacy to not not that you know if you eat a bowl of Greek yogurt it's gonna like replace you overnight? But is there some legitimacy to uh, the role that that can potentially play in in helping uh, you know uh, help one's help one's health? If that makes sense. I think so. Yeah. I'm a huge fan of the whole foods mm -hmm. in, in general, like using whole foods first and using yeah. diet first yeah. and then filling the gaps with supplements and, yeah. and then using medications if you need to. Yeah. And I know people a lot of times think that pharmacists, I'll, I'll have people usually preface a conversation with me of like, well, hey, I, I want to try something healthy first <laughs> as if I'm like, no, take the drugs. Don't want you to be healthy. So <laughs> I know. And it makes me so sad because yeah. actually that is my entire education at where I went to school anyways was yeah. always, we always learned the lifestyle intervention first. Yeah. And then the diet intervention first, yeah. and then non even non pharmacologic therapy, yeah. and then pharmacologic therapy. Yeah. So that is how your pharmacist is taught. Yeah. Just everybody out there, just know that we are not like dying for you to be on medications. <laughs> that would be the drug company, yeah. not your pharmacist. Yeah. There's a difference. Yeah, yeah, and I think it's interesting too because it, there's so many different layers to like this whole conversation. I I, I find it very interesting, but um, you know. From what I can see, I think a lot of times many people's attitudes towards what you just said of kind of like, you know, examining your lifestyle first and then examining your habits and then your diet and then like so on and so forth. And then kind of, I don't want to say a last ditch effort, but kind of not, not letting medication be the crux of your health if you can help it. Like I know that there are people that have, uh, you know, disorders and diseases that they, they have to take medicines for. And obviously we're not talking about, about that right now. Um, but I do think it's interesting that for a lot of people, the attitude of improving their health or, you know, kind of righting a wrong, however you want to look at it is often reversed. Uh, and, and, and then trust me, like I, I'm not sitting up here. Like I've, I've figured it all out myself because I'm not an expert and I'm human just like the rest of us. And sometimes like when you're feeling bad, you just want to take the medicine, you know, that'll, that you believe will help you and just be on with your day. Mm -hmm. Um, but I do find it interesting that that a lot of times is our attitude is just kind of trying to find that quick fix or what we think will be a permanent fix, but might actually be a band-aid fix, uh, in the long run, you know, um, because there are things like I myself have learned like the value of, uh, you know, the value of things like exercising daily or just moving in a, in a daily way. And it's not just like in, it doesn't just improve your life and your health in the sense of like, Oh, you, you won't be as sick as often, but there's so many different benefits to these things and to like eating a, a diet that consists of, you know, whole foods and things like that. Obviously there's, there's much more to this conversation, but the, the point I'm making is I think it's very interesting that a lot of times our attitude is on that is, is flipped, you know, uh, when it probably shouldn't be, you know, I think it's coming back around. It seems like your generation wants that to be changed. And I think as maybe seen the air of older generations ways, mm -hmm. because every, and this is the way I often talk about medications or always talk about medications. There is always a risk benefit ratio mm -hmm. to every medication out there. There's not one out there that is a magic mm -hmm. bullet to so cliche, but that doesn't come with some type of risk. Yeah. There will be a side effect of mm -hmm. some sort. Yeah. So um, it's so much better to not need the medication. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think it's kind of what you talked about there. You know, I think part of, cause I, I agree. I think that the, the, these conversations about, you know, trying to improve your health in a way that doesn't just revolve around taking a medication that may or may not, you know, fix your problem. Uh, I think I'd like to think a lot of that is due to the fact that, you know, like 
my parents, uh, when they were growing up, like they didn't have access to like, they didn't have access to this. I'm holding up my phone for those that are listening. Uh, like they didn't have access to the fact that, you know, you, I can look up like, Oh, is this, is this food like generally a good thing to eat or not? Should I trust this kind of medic? Like they didn't have that. And so growing up for them, it may have just been like what their parents told them or just kind of what their friends told them, or they just kind of, you know, their doctor was the trusted one. So they just went with what they told them. But at the, like, there's also a flip side to that coin because there's just as much good as there is bad that you can look up. Like for every good article of like, oh yeah, you should eat more of, of more broccoli. I don't know, whatever. There's going to be 10 other articles. that's like, no, don't do that. This is a terrible thing. You're going to ruin your family lineage, lineage if you do this one thing. And it can be hard at times to kind of parse through that and make sense of what's good, what's bad, what's worth your time and what isn't, you know? So it's a, I think it's a kind of a human issue that we will always have. It'll just always come in different ways, ways, shapes, and forms. You know, the, the kind of health issues and the, and the making sense of everything, the, the way that my generation does now is going to look different from my parents' generation. And it's going to look different from, you know, my kid's generation. It's going to, it's going to all be different, but, uh, it's, it's just really interesting how this is, it's, it's always a topic of conversation about how, uh, what's kind of the best way to get ahead of uh, preventative or get ahead of health issues, you know, and, and what's, what's the best way of doing that in the future, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I think it's always root cause finding. That's what, that's how I try to approach every patient is like, yeah. we've got to try to find the root cause here because otherwise it is just bandaging. Yeah. But I know exactly what you're talking about because I think who taught me recently, I have an ER physician friend that's getting more into functional medicine and um, there's something about cooked broccoli. I think you need a little bit of chopped raw broccoli because it has an enzyme, I think, called myrosinase. Someone correct me, I might be wrong. And you need that enzyme because then it converts the sulforaphane into something else. And I was like, oh my Lord, like how, <laughs> how will any of us ever know? And yeah. that's where it's just like, Eat, eat your whole foods. Yeah. Just like eat your whole foods, yeah. do your best. <laughs> yeah. Exercise. Yeah. yeah. No, it was. And then take a good phyto multi vitamin. Yeah. yeah. No, it was funny. I, I, I uh, also heard, uh, I forget what it was, but it was some podcast with this, this health expert and they were like, they had talked about something. It was some kind of cruciferous vegetable. And they were like, yeah, when you eat it, like, you know, when you cook it, this kind of vitamin or this kind of mineral gets absorbed by your body at this rate. But if you add it, I forget they said something like, but if you add just a little bit of like ground mustard to it, then this, the rate of absorption with this vitamin or mineral will get absorbed by like 10 times the normal speed. And I was like, okay. So I, like I had some mustard like ground at my apartment. I was like, okay, I'll put it on like whatever. But then like, if I didn't have it, I was like, oh no, I'm not gonna, <laughs> what should I do it? And then at some point I was like, you know what? I'll just eat the thing. And if I have the mustard, yes. I'll put it on. If not, I'm not going to lose sleep over, you know, now we're in a like mental health topic because yeah. that is just triggering my yeah like OCD. Yeah. I mean that that's like my all or nothing thinking right there. Yeah. That's yeah. a problem. Yeah. Yeah. No. <laughs> now all of a sudden I'm like, sorry kids, eat some ramen noodles. I'm going to lay in my bed. <laughs> nothing matters. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, and it's funny you mentioned that like that is something that like I, I have personal, like my, my relationship with food and just my diet in general has been something that I've personally dealt with a lot in my own life, but I know that that's such a for a lot of people, that's such a difficult thing to move past because it's who, who doesn't want to live like a healthier life. Like if, if you, people that are unhealthy generally know that they are unhealthy. Like it's, it, it's not hard to like, people know that, uh, but it's not always as simple as just being like, Oh, well you should just eat, you know, a cup of raw broccoli every day and you'll be, you'll be good. Like if it was that simple, more people would do it. Like it, it's just not because it's very difficult. Uh, our relationship to food we oftentimes have that all or nothing mentality. It's like, oh, well, I, I really want this cookie and I've done really well, but if I eat this cookie, I'm afraid that just like all of my progress will go out the door and I'll just say, you know, forget it. What was the point anyways? And I'm just, you know what, you know what? I'll just eat this whole box of cookies. Like it can very easily kind of snowball downhill into, a, and it's, it's such a difficult thing to overcome at times, you know? Uh, but it, it's, I think that that is something that a lot of people think there's not a way they, they think it's a problem that they can't uh, overcome, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't want to assume too many things about everybody, but just based on my own experience and the conversations I've had with people, it's, I mean, food is something we obviously need to, you know, make use of. It's a resource we have to have. And so our relationship to that, oftentimes I've found that for me, it's not necessarily 
what I'm eating, but it's oftentimes my view of that thing that I'm eating. If I, if I eat something and I view like, oh my gosh, that was a terrible thing. What have you done? Like that's going to do a lot more harm for me than just eating it, enjoying it and moving on. Absolutely. Uh, if you view the things that you eat as it's a horrible thing and you've just ruined everything and now you're a terrible person and look at, you just squandered all the, all the progress you've made. That can be a, a very big hole you can dig yourself into very quickly, and it's hard to get out of that. Very much so. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's it's a it's a tough kind of battle to fight, uh, but it, it's one that uh, I sympathize with anybody that that deals with that. You know, I do too. Yeah. And that's actually an area that we have a couple formulations that do use medications, yeah. and they target more the mental health side yeah. because so much of weight, and they're really effective weight loss therapies because so much of the the I've never truly seen the appetite suppressants actually work because I think it you end up in that roller coaster of the all or nothing thinking anyways because once that thing wears off it's more about the serotonin because you know you're eating to get that mood boost and then you're crashing and then the guilt sets in yeah. and then also um, we use naltrexone a lot as well too mm -hmm. which is it will block um, endorphins, but therefore it boosts your natural endorphins. That's yeah. a rebound effect. Yeah. So it's really neat. Like there's ways that we can target some of th these emotional eatings to try to break eating, I guess you would say dysfunction, mm -hmm. um, to try to break that cycle. Because yeah. it can be a cycle that you can unlearn and realize like, okay, I can be a little gentler on myself. Yeah. Like it's okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, I remember there was a, there was a point for me where like I was... I was really wanting to kind of get my, my health in order. And I, I was like, you know, exercising on a, on a frequent basis. And like, I was eating all the things I knew I had to eat. And, and for whatever reason, I found myself in a situation where, uh, like there was some, there was like food and someone had made like some, like some cookies. And in my mind, I was like, oh my gosh, I would, I would love to have one of those cookies. But I was like, Daniel, no, you can't have that. Like, that's not allowed. Like you, you can never eat one ever again. Oh, no. And it just, and, and yeah, in my mind, I was like, for a moment there, I was like, man, I just, I can't like, man, I'm, I'm never gonna be able to eat these things again. And I had to realize to myself, like life is too short to not enjoy these things yeah. sometimes. And if you, you know, if you want to enjoy something, just enjoy it. Like that's perfectly fine. Obviously don't, you know, don't make cookies and milk your, you know, the crux of your diet, but one is not going to, is not going to, you know, over is not going to overrule all the progress you've made. And, and honestly, I would, I would say in my personal experience, having a little bit of fun every now and then and eating that dessert when you, you know, when you want to, it can be a, a stepping stone to you to live a more healthy life. Uh, not obviously not like eating a whole cake by yourself, but when it's your birthday, eat a little bit of cake, like have a good time, you know, enjoy it. And then let that, let that remind you that you can enjoy these things. And also you can live a healthy life and eat the things you need to eat and live a balanced and healthy life. Uh, yeah. so yeah. For, for what it's worth. <laughs> that, that's for me. <laughs> I know. And this isn't necessarily my area either, but I was, yeah. um, I did athletics my whole life and played soccer yeah. in college. And for me, working out started to be the same. Like if yeah. I did not have the hardest workout yeah. where I almost am like passing out, then it's nothing. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, I had to get past that where yeah. a walk could be a workout because yeah. a walk's better than nothing. Yeah. But I used to be like, nope, if, if it's not like yeah. a super hard workout, it's nothing. Yeah. 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 <laughs> No, I agree. And, and that the, the all or nothing mentality in a lot of ways can be a very, very detrimental mm -hmm. thing. Uh, so I agree. It's something I kind of change the subject a little bit, something I want to ask you about that, you know, in kind of in line with buzzwords and the things that have been tossed around a lot recently. Uh, so this, this may sound silly, but I hear a lot about the, the conversation, I guess I'll put it this way, the, the conversation that people have around the impact that the sun has on us. And obviously I know that we can get sunburnt and like, that's a bad thing, yeah. but I hear, you know, I hear a lot of people that they'll talk about like, oh, you need to put this kind of sunscreen on every day and you need to make sure you're wearing this every day or else you're mm -hmm. going to look like, you know, like an old leather jacket in the future or something like, and, and it's such a, I know nothing about it. Like I hear, I hear it a lot and I hear people talk about this a lot. And I guess my question for you is, what positive and negative impacts does the sun play on on our skin as a as a whole? Like I know obviously I'm, I know obviously we need to be in sunlight to a degree and we need to get vitamin D from mm -hmm. it, but there's there's two very prominent kind of sides of this conversation that I hear a lot. One being you need to be outside, you need to get sunlight, enjoy it, be in it, feel it, use it, be in the sunlight. And there's also the conversation of like if you're in the sunlight for 10 minutes, you're going to look like an old, old baseball in the future, you know? So like, yeah. what, how, how do, how do we make sense of all this? I, um, so from a skincare perspective, I'm going to say to use on your face, 
and your arms. <laughs> a physical sunblock. Yeah. That, those are my favorite. Physical sunblock is something that um, uses, basically it physically blocks the rays of the sun instead of chemically. Yeah, that's what, that's what I was about. So you, yeah. do you mean like... Like clothes so, in the ta- sense, or well, like what? clothes can be a physical, yeah. um, but no, I actually mean titanium dioxide or zinc oxide. Okay, so those are actually minerals that sit on top of your skin, oh. and they're great for sensitive skin. Yeah. You have to reapply them more often, unfortunately, but they don't cause like that redness reaction. Have you ever had that reaction, like when you put on sunblock and you turn red, or you feel hot? Uh, not not necessarily the red, but the, the okay. hot. Yes. So yeah. then there's chemical yeah. sunblocks. Yeah. And and you've probably heard um, like PABA free yes. and this, that, and the other because they can have reproductive risks, um, cancer risks in and of themselves. Yeah. Um, and those are chemicals. So those those chemically alter the light so that yeah. and those can be just really irritating to the skin. Like yeah. they can cause acne breakouts, and those are just not my favorite. Yeah. So that's skin. Yeah. I think that the other part of it, like you said about vitamin D. Yeah. I think humans need to be outside. I, I would agree. Yeah, <laughs> and yeah. I think they need to be in nature. <laughs> yeah. And I think they need to breathe some fresh air yeah. and oxygen yeah. and feel the sun on their I agree. Faces. No, I'm I'm a big proponent of riding with the windows down and feeling the sun on you whenever you're you know you're you're driving. Uh but but what kind of what you mentioned though, so I've I've already forgotten the the names of them, oh, but titanium yes, dioxide. Yes. So so what two two parts. What exactly how do you come into, like, how, how would I go and get that, and how do you apply that, I guess? Oh, that's – typically, it's going to be – it's going to look no different than any other sunblock. It's yeah. just going to say physical sunblock or titanium. It, it's going to say it in the active ingredients. Gotcha. So it's going to look no different. It's okay. going to be your basic cream or spray oh, or, or anything. You're not going to find it in gel because in the yeah. old days, it used to be – that classic, like that white nose that you would see yeah. in well, the that, 80s, yeah. like that was zinc. Yeah. But it's come a long way. Now it's micronized and like they use like nanotechnology yeah. and they've made the particles so small that it doesn't look as bad as it used to. So when I, when I think of zinc, I think of like the supplement that people take. Is that any way of helping it or is this <laughs> something totally uh, different? No, totally different. Because okay. you do okay. need the phys- you need it on your skin because gotcha. it's physically blocking okay, the gotcha. sun's rays. Yeah. See, I didn't know that. See, see in my mind, and that, that's why I want to ask like I, I, I definitely felt like there was some kind of protection that would be advised, but like there was a part of me that's like, I don't want to go and have to buy like a bunch of sunscreen and apply it all the day. Like I work an office job. Like what? Well, it's gonna be so weird if I walk in and I'm just like white and pasty on my face. I'm like, hey guy, like you know, I was like, what, what, what do I need to do here? You know? Well, I yeah. would if I was you. They do make really nice yeah. mineral, even tinted. And I know that sounds funny, maybe to you, but. Um, <laughs> You do need to be applying some yeah. type of sunscreen in the morning to your face because it will even know. driving. Yeah, because you're getting a lot of sun that you don't yeah. know about. Yeah, but again, with y'all's generation, it's a little different. Yeah. I feel like the younger generation were so more conscious conscious of it, uh-huh. but like my generation, you know, we were like doing the baby oil on like laying <laughs> out on the roof. Yeah, because the you know, the roof was black. Yeah. Yeah. So I think you guys are going to be fine. <laughs> so, so are the, are these products, are these things you can like go buy at Walmart or CVS or something? Okay. Yep, well, everywhere. Interesting. Mm-hmm. interesting. I didn't know that. Well, I'm definitely going to have to look into that because they even, they for sure make a really cool men's something yeah. or another that has SPF something in it. Cool. For sure. Cool. Yeah. Well, I apply it every morning. Interesting. Well, I didn't know that. Well, I'll have to, I'll have to go and check that out. Cause that way, if it feels like a lotion and it's yeah. just like, you know, nice to apply. It's not a big deal. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and that's why I say like in my mind, like whenever I hear about like, you know, apply these things, I'm like, I don't want to, I'm, I'm thinking of like, like you said, the classic, like your nose is why I'm like, I don't want to, I don't, do I really want to do that? Like, do I just want to play the odds and say, you know, I think I'll be okay. But, uh, I didn't, I didn't I know about these Jack things. Black, have you ever heard of that brand? I think they sold it at Sephora. It's called Jack Black. I know they make a really nice, just like morning moisturizer that has SPF yeah. 20 in it. I haven't, I haven't heard of it. Does men. it, does it have like any association with like the celebrity I Jack Black? I don't <laughs> think so, but wouldn't that be great? I feel like that makes it better. Listen, I, feel, I feel like if, if they're not associated, like his, his team needs to get in touch with their team and yes, be like, Hey, they should I see a connection Maybe here, you know, <laughs> but it seems like his face should be right on the front if they are. And it's not. That's so funny. that's awesome. 
uh, b- before we kind of begin wrapping up things here, one, one kind of final thing I want to ask you about. So you said towards the beginning uh, that you have always been interested in chemistry. Uh, and and I, I'm interested to ask you a little bit about that because uh, I am... I consider myself to be a fairly curious person. Like I like to learn new things, but chemistry was always a field that I was good enough in it that I could, I could pass like chemistry one and two in high school and college. But like, it was never something I felt like I had a great grasp on. And it was always something I was kind of like, yeah, once I'm done with that, I'll, I'll just let it kind of be its own thing. And my fiance, she, uh, a couple semesters ago, she took organic chemistry and like, that's like the class. And you know, it's, it's, it's a class that you hear a lot of horror stories about. And, you know, she was definitely glad to be done with it when she finished it. And so my, my question for you is one, did you enjoy organic chemistry just out of curiosity? Uh, and, and two, what, what is it do you think about just chemistry in general that attracted you to it? Uh, because part of the reason I asked that is my dad also, he is also, he's not a pharmacist, but he is a, uh, he's an internal medicine doctor and he oh, okay. loves chemistry, loves it all the time. And yeah. I couldn't, I, I'm, I don't love it like that, but I'm, I, yeah. I think it's very interesting just how our approaches to these subjects can be very different, sure. you know? Uh, so I, I just want to kind of pick your brain on that a little bit. Sure. I'm more so, I'm going to dork out for a second. <laughs> I love it. I love math. And really? I think I liked, so Gen Chem 1 and 2, I loved the way you could just do the stoichiometry and it all made sense. <laughs> There's a word I haven't heard in a while. Out. Stoichiometry, <laughs> the word of the day. Um, organic wasn't necessarily my favorite. Yeah. You know, I, it's like you've got carbon, hydrogen, yeah. nitrogen, and oxygen. Yeah. A million different ways. Yeah. Yay. Yeah. And, you know, I like biochem. Mm-hmm. It's interesting. I mean, of course, it's interesting to know all those different cycles. But again, we still, it's biochem is just organic mm-hmm. um, in your body. And that's great. Um, what I loved, though, was physical chemistry. Yeah. So what was so cool about that is you have to take all this math. And I didn't realize math could go so far. Math almost becomes <laughs> a religion. <laughs> It really does. There was a point in partial differential equations. I was like, what are we even learning anymore? <laughs> like it's, I'm not even solving problems. I'm just like, I don't even know what this is. Yeah. But it was so neat because you were doing triple integrals that were essentially telling you the path of an electron. Yeah. You know, it, it and I could not believe that the universe could be summed up like that. And I could solve the path of an electron (laughs) on an eight and a half pill by 11 sheet of paper and get the right answer. Yeah. What? And well, 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 that right there is something that (laughs) first off, I'm one of my, one of my best friends, his name is Cade. He'll probably hear this at some point. He was big chemistry guy. He'll probably hear this and be like, I know what you're talking about. (laughs) Uh, But in, in that sense, that was always something that struck me as, extremely interesting because like I wasn't, I was perfectly good enough at chemistry to get, like I said, to get past gin chem one and two, but that was kind of the extent for me. Uh, but I always found it very interesting. Like, you know, you, you go in any chemistry class, you're going to have the, the periodic table of elements up on the wall. And like, there's going to be different, uh, different pictures. And it always fascinated me that even if I wasn't entirely sure of everything that was going on, like we were, we were solving problems related to things that were infinitely small like the desk that we're we're, that we're you know sitting at right now was is made of things that are real and tangible and true and like we can touch it and see it and feel it but the things that make it and make us up are are all on this wall right here and they are so small you could never imagine how many there are and how small they are it just it's something that it's it's almost impossible to wrap my mind around you know just thinking about it's like that's that's what we're learning about. You know, we're, we're putting that onto paper, like you said, and again, I wasn't an expert at it, but I just, that idea of really, of, of making the world big and small at the same time, you know, uh, it's, it, it was very interesting. I thought that that conversation was extremely interesting and, and something that even to this day, I think is just, it, it, it kind of blows my mind a little bit, you know, mine uh, as well. Yeah. And I was like, wow, yeah. Math for something. It's the language. <laughs> yeah. Math is a language. Yeah. I get it now. Yeah. And, and yeah. And it's, it's interesting too. Like we would do the, the, the chemistry labs in school and you know, they'd be like, all right, you're going to have this chemical or this, this element in, in one hand and you're going to have this thing and you're going to do a few things and it's going to look like this in the end. And you know, in your mind, it's like, that's not, that's not going to happen. But 
it's just, I don't know. It's again, I'm not an expert in it, but it's very interesting just to see how everything around us can be broken down into these tiny, tiny, tiny little things. And they make up everything around us. The, yeah. the, you know, the, the air we breathe, the, the walls around us, like everything is these tiny little particles that all work together in unison in this kind of crazy way. Uh, so I always thought that was very interesting. And just like you said, we're, you know, something that I have not done, but you said like you're charting the path of, of an electron on paper. Uh, just that idea is crazy. You know, it's, it's very interesting. So, and that um, someone figured that out. Yeah. Like, that's the thing that, to that, guy. that, that's the <laughs> thing that blows my mind too. Also is like, you know, there'll be times I'm like using my phone and I'm like, how does this thing work? Like who, who discovered this? You know, like know. what was the first, who, who was the first person that was like, you know, what if we, what if we make this a screen? And they're like, what, what is that? And I, I don't know. It's just like, we, I'm glad we I have know. smart people, you know, know. <laughs> yes. that's awesome. That's awesome. Uh, well, well, Tanya, first off, I just want to say thank you for, for joining me. Uh, it's, it's been a, like I said, one of my favorite parts about having this opportunity to talk with people is talking with people that are very smart and experts in their field and smarter than me in a lot of ways. So I'm, I'm, it's been great getting to chat with you and I, I just thank you for taking Likewise. a little bit of time to chat with me. Yeah. This, this uh, yeah. Before we finish up, uh, kind of a tradition with the show, something I want to do real quick is I like to finish each show with a little fun segment at the end called 15 quick questions. Uh, so these are going to be 15, this or that questions, totally unrelated to everything we've just talked okay. about. Uh, and I just want to hear your, your thoughts off the top of your head. So does that sound good with that you? That sounds good. All right. This is going to be 15 quick questions with uh, Miss Tanya. First off, beach vacation or mountain vacation? Mountain. All right. I, I would agree. I'm, I'm a big, big mountain guy. Uh, hot coffee or iced coffee? Or you can substitute tea or whatever beverage of choice you like here. Iced coffee. Iced coffee. Nice. Uh, summer, fall, winter, or spring? Summer. Uh, sweet or savory food? Savory. In your opinion, are Crocs fashionable? Yes or no? <laughs> you're, you're not you're not rocking Crocs in the not no, even like um. <laughs> I don't do it, but my daughter did get me to yeah. get a pair of slides. Yes, and the, I wear those sometimes at the beach. I I had a pair of I had a pair of Crocs way back in the day, and I haven't had any since then. But they, I was I was a big Crocs guy when I was younger, so <laughs> they are comfortable. They, they can be, yes. Uh, all right. Pineapple on pizza. Yes or no? Yes. Oh, thank you. Good. I, I'm a, that's, I, I've told some of my friends, I'm, I don't have many hills I'm going to die on, but that's a hill <laughs> that I will die on. Uh, which do you prefer sunrise or sunset? Sunset. Nice. Uh, guacamole or salsa? Which do you prefer? Guacamole. Guacamole is good. I'm, I'm growing to appreciate it the more I get older. Uh, all right. Would you rather play a card game or a board game? Cards. Nice. Uh, which you prefer crunchy peanut butter or smooth peanut butter? Smooth. Nice. Um, would you rather read the book or see the movie? Read the book. Who in your mind wins in a dance battle? The rock or Kevin Hart? Oh, the rock. <laughs> <laughs> he wins at everything, anything. Uh, all right. Which decade do you prefer? Seventies, eighties, or nineties? Nineties. All right. Last two questions here of the kind of four final major holidays in the year. Which do you prefer? Halloween, Thanksgiving, Christmas, or New Year's? Christmas. I love Christmas. Big. I'm a. I am a. I've said this many times. I'm a Christmas music in September kind of person. <laughs> so that's just right up my alley. Uh, and then final question. I ask this question of everybody. I want to hear. I want to hear your answer and kind of your your rationale with it as well. Would you rather fight a hundred duck sized horses or one horse sized duck? <laughs> so you got to. So gotta I will tell you, my friend, my friend Gretchen, told me what it was like getting. You don't get bit by a duck. You get like <laughs> su sucked on by a duck. Really? Like they. I didn't know. They, I've like, never. I've never. You know, encountered ducks like this. Interesting. <laughs> it hurts. I didn't know that. I so, imagine it would. So what you, was the question again? So you got a you got a hundred tiny horses, a hundred duck that, sized horses, or rather, one really really big horse sized duck. I don't I don't want to fight a horse sized <laughs> duck. I want to so, do a bunch. I'm just gonna kick those horses <laughs> hard over like just. So that's your that's your yes. tactic, just just, <laughs> yeah. kicking, just kicking around. <laughs> I've got a really good kick. I love it. I love it. 
Awesome. Awesome. Well, that, that's all the questions I got for you. So thank you for, thank you for playing along. You heard it here, folks. She's going to take the, take the hundred tiny horses. Uh, <laughs> thankfully you will never have to encounter that. So you don't have to worry about it too much. Um, but Tanya, before we finish up, uh, do you have any like links or websites or social medias that people can find you on and, and follow you along at or anything yeah, like that? On Instagram, I'm at goddess guy doctor after my Ted talk. Yeah. And then we're at designer drugs pharmacy. Awesome. If you want to come see me. Cool. Cool. Well, I will put the links for that down in the description. So if you're listening and want to check, uh, check her out and check out what she's doing, then that will be down there. Um, but yeah, thank you again for taking some time to chat with me today. It's been a lot of fun. I've, I've had the pleasure of getting to talk with a lot of really cool people and you're just another one of them. Oh, so thank, thank you very you. much. Yeah, I appreciate it. Uh, and to everybody out there listening, thank you as always for tuning in. I appreciate you taking some time to uh, check in on the conversation today. Uh, if you'd like to check out any of the links, as were mentioned, they'll be down in the description. If you'd like to follow me or the podcast, that will also be in the description. And if you'd like to contact me, that will also be down in the description. Uh, again, thank you for coming in and thank you all for tuning in. I will catch you all on another episode of the podcast. Goodbye, everybody. Thanks for tuning into this episode of the podcast. As one final reminder, if you'd like to support the show, then don't forget to rate and review the show wherever you get your podcast or share it with a friend. If you'd like to check out any links that were mentioned during the show or follow the show or myself on social media, then feel free to head to the description of today's episode to find these links. As always, thank you again for checking out today's episode. and I really hope you enjoyed it. I'll catch you all on the next episode of the podcast. See ya.